is the beginning of January or January. <laughs> Wishful thinking is the beginning of December. <laughs> we were just talking about year end and here I am thinking it's 2021 already. Uh, my name is Matthew Struck. This is Precious, my partner in crime. How's it going, Precious? Hey, guys. Welcome back. Hopefully the Thanksgiving break treated you well and now we're back in the saddle ready to go. Yep, most definitely. Lots of uh, turkey and uh, smaller family gatherings. I know I'm going to be eating leftovers for probably the next year and a half, but uh, <laughs> such is life. Uh, for anyone who is unfamiliar, this show is Sell Like a CPC. We are put on by the Agents and Brokers Interest Group. Uh, this is a uh, live cast that is dedicated to bringing you tips, tricks, uh, sales opportunities, little uh, things that can give you a competitive advantage uh, when you're out there running and gunning and selling. And it's specifically for CPCUs, but also for non-CPCUs that are interested in upping their game. So uh, before we get rolling really quickly, make sure to like, comment, subscribe, share, retweet, hit the notification bell, uh, send up a smoke signal, whatever you have to do in order to let us know that you are watching or to let others know that they should be tuning in as well. We do take live comments and questions and address them. So if you are watching live or even if you watch this in recording afterward, uh, give us your comments, your feedback, your questions, and we'll make sure to have a conversation with you. Um, so yeah, so this week uh, we are talking about upselling. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Precious, but a lot of people outside of the insurance industry don't exactly have the best, um, should I say, opinion of the word upselling? Is that accurate? I agree. It kind of has negative connotations as if it's overselling or selling something that's unnecessary. Mm. Um, but really in our industry, you know, I there's rarely a scenario, at least anything I've come along, where I can tell someone that they have the most coverage like possible, like there's every, everyone can stand to be better covered. So I think that you're right in the insurance industry. That's not a bad word and it's not a bad concept. Yeah, I, I think <clears throat> pretty routinely brokers get hit with this line, right? It's a client or it's a prospect and they say, look, just give me the bare minimum that I need to get by with, right? Like whatever the cheapest possible is that you could say I have insurance. Um, and, and then the sales process really begins. Um, so I, I don't know, like we could attack this from a couple of different directions. I, I, I think the first thing that maybe we could talk about is, do you have a lead up like to that conversation or to the, the final kind of pitch while you're doing the, the field underwriting and the applications and stuff like that? Are you setting, um, are you setting up that swing at the end all throughout that process? Um, I think all throughout the process, it kind of has to be peppered in, you know, in the beginning, you know, making sure that, you know, as far as setting expectations, that customers understand that insurance is part of a greater risk management program. Mm. And so introducing them to the kind of the concepts and the tenets of risk management and that insurance is just one way to transfer risk. And so it doesn't reduce risk. It doesn't keep things from happening. It just transfers what, who and what's going to respond when, not if, but when they do. And so if you can get that buy-in and that understanding up front, then you put the customer in the mindset of when these things happen, who do you want to pay? Do you want us to pay or are you comfortable paying? Because when they understand by not purchasing the insurance, <laughs> they've agreed to self-insure or retain that risk. Yeah. You know, and so when people go into it, understanding that, you know, the insurance product is just a tool that can be leveraged, but it has to be part of a greater program. So we've got to talk about things like, you know, loss mitigation, risk avoidance, you know, and so this is just, you know, what's going to be in place. So if these things still happen, even after you've applied these other, you know, fixes, then you've got, you know, another, you know, set of pockets that are ready to pay. So that has to be like the initial conversation to set the groundwork for what we're about to do. And now we're just going to make two piles. What do you want to, you know, source out versus what are you comfortable stroking a check for? 
Yeah, that's a that's a good one. I like the um, I like the concept of talking about like self insurance or what that ends up looking like. Uh, what's funny is, so I had this conversation a couple of years back. I was at kind of like a trade show kind of deal, um, and that the the trade show was for I, I don't even know if I want to say it was an industry specific trade show, and um, this one person had a piece of equipment, and he came up to me and. Quite frankly, right from the very beginning, I got this kind of like, um, how should I put it, kind of like a schmarmy feel (laughs) about the individual who was talking to me, who owned this business that he was obviously asking me about. Um, And he had a piece of equipment that he said that the bank was requiring him to insure for a certain amount. And he said, I don't want to pick up the coverage. I, I think I should... Uh, I shouldn't have to carry insurance. I said, so you're choosing self-insurance. He said, that's not what I said. I said, that's exactly what you said. If the thing gets hit by lightning or it catches on fire, you're paying for it. So you're paying the, you're self-insuring that risk. Um, and so then we went down a very dark hole of having an argument over what self-insurance was um, as, as he uh, proselytized to me, you know, what my job was. But um that being said, I think that's a good good starting point is, you know, talking about what, you know, like you said, what you want to cover yourself and pay for yourself versus what you expect will be paid for after the fact. Um, is it also helpful to go through a coverage checklist at the beginning of the marketing and field underwriting process so that then you can, re, you know, revisit that at the end? So I think that that's kind of twofold and it depends on the sophistication of who you're talking to, right? Because oftentimes, you know, almost, you know, comparing it to the doctor office visit where, you know, before we get into what you're taking and that sort of thing, we want to really truly assess standalone what the ailments are, right? And so before I even talk about the coverage that they have, the policy that's in place, I want to identify the need. You know, and then we can, once we have gone through this identification and this agreement process, so we say that these are exposures that exist. Do you agree? These are the things, you know, that you've got, you know, to lose. And so now let's talk about your current policy and let's apply that litmus test. So once we've agreed on these exposures, let's look at what your current program is prepared to do. And then let's ask ourselves, are we truly satisfied with how that would respond? And so to take like a non PNC angle to it, you know, I compare it a lot to, you know, before I got into PNC, I was on the life and health side. And so on the life and health side, I think that uh, customers were a little bit more familiar with this concept of utilization. Hmm. And so they knew that, you know, the overall cost of a plan was bigger than premium. So we would talk to them about who are your doctors, what are your meds, what sort of care do you need? And you would show them oftentimes side by side, well, this particular plan may be costing X number of dollars less per month. But by the time you factor in this co-payment, these co-insurances, these percentages, really you're better off buying a slightly more expensive plan Mm -hmm. because you can more predictably you know, address what the costs, you know, are going to be. And so that mindset is more prevalent, I think, in the life and health side of the business. When we get into the PNC world, part of that risk management conversation is we're going to talk about best practices and things that you can do. So hopefully you never have to use what I'm about to sell you. Right. Yes. (laughs) But if you have to use it, and I think maybe that's the mindset is on the health insurance side, you buy it with the intention of using it you know, on the property casualty side of it, you hope you never have to, but should you need to, you need it to respond. And so one of the concepts that's hard for consumers to wrap their minds around, especially existing businesses or existing consumers that have had coverage that they've paid for and they've never had to tap into. Right. So this whole intangible product, that coverage was there and you should just be grateful you didn't have to call on it. You know, year after year, they start looking at it like, well, if the chances of me using it are small, why am I spending, you know, current money to pay for something that doesn't happen on a frequent basis? And so that's kind of where, in my opinion, that's also where you set yourself apart as an advisor versus just an order taker. And the reason I don't like to start with the current policy is I don't want to go down this rabbit hole of trying to match coverage 
if we haven't even come to a consensus that that's the necessary coverage. That's a good point. That's a really good point. We're, we're joined by some uh, semi-royalty here. Mike Kay is watching the broadcast. Oh. Thank you for tuning in, Mike Kay. Uh, pa past president of the CPCU Society, uh, has sat on numerous uh, leadership councils and committees, and uh, he's basically Mr. CPCU. So I'm really happy that Mike's been able to join us. Absolutely. Um, I, I love the fact that you you went through kind of that that process. Um, I think it's very much the reason why I mentioned kind of like a coverage checklist is a lot of times uh, agencies will put that coverage checklist in at the end. And I think that's a mistake. I think uh, like to your point where you're saying like we haven't even necessarily agreed on the coverages that you'll take value from. Um, it, and it also has a, 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 a another positive effect in that we're not just going to root out things that you might not know that you've been exposed, you're going to be exposed to. But we're also going to be um, we're also going to be finding things that maybe you're paying for that you don't need, Absolutely. or or you know you didn't know that like an endorsement was added on and there's an additional premium that's associated with it because that's just the standard bundle of endorsements that that agency decides to put on those policies. So there's a give and take there. What I also like is I like the follow through. So at the heart of it, a good upsell is a value discussion, right? Absolutely. You're, you're you're, you're talking about, all right, how much you pay versus how much you get. So if you're going kind of stepwise with the check mar marks and you're saying, okay, you have an exposure to A, B, and C. Uh, if I cover you for A and C, this is how much it costs. If I cover you for, you know, B and C, this is how much, or A, B, and C, this is how much it costs. I think that really kind of helps. It doesn't necessarily completely remove that conversation about like I just want to pay as as little as possible. You know, um, sometimes people just don't see the value in insurance. Period, uh, which is unfortunate because they're the ones that get hit the hardest by that. Um, how should I put it? That that you know mythology or or whatever that they're that they're a part of. But um, that that is something that really helps because you're you're now kind of lining things up and you're saying okay. And, and back to your point earlier. Okay, well. If you want to go bare on this line of coverage and self-insure, you'll save this amount of money, right? And then the follow-up question as a good risk manager or a good enterprise risk manager is, all right, if you're saving that money, keep it in your damn pocket, yes. okay? Because don't say you're going to save that money. It's like going back to the, the health insurance and more personal insurance, the, the uh, you know, buy term and invest the rest cr crowd, okay? How many people invest the rest? The follow-up. Like that's – yeah. <laughs> They're like, oh, I could buy a nicer car now. I say forty dollars a month. Like that's exactly what it ends up coming down to. Uh, Mike K agrees. He says, oh, it's always risky to quote apples to apples. That is completely true, um, and uh, it, it definitely doesn't set you apart as an advisor if that's all you're doing, right? Because then you're just kind of you are commoditizing yourself, and you're just saying, all right, for the same exact thing, what's my price, right? Um, so, so that's a apples to apples, even that whole concept, you know, and I used to tell people, you know, that's kind of my my go to phrase is I avoid apples to apples because I don't know where your apples came from. Mm. I don't know <laughs> with all of the selection available. They could have worms in them. Was, they may have worms in them. You know, you may be going to the grocery store that maybe has two flavors and I'm introducing you to the farmer's market. Right. Mm. And so we're like, OK, let's find what's really you know, going to make sense, because I think that oftentimes, you know, trying to go through this this process so that you can kind of get them out of their head. We're not. Let's talk about your coverage. Let's not talk about your policy. Those are two separate things. Right. right. You derive coverage from the policy, but let's just talk about your need for coverage. And so like what you were mentioning earlier, oftentimes, you know, what you're doing is you're reallocating the resources and you're saying, if I had to choose one over the other, I would actually maybe take this from here and put this over here because your first party coverage, you know, on your property, you have that decision of do I want to replace it right now? Do I want to repair it right now? But from a liability standpoint, you don't have a say so when right. you're at fault in a situation on how much gets paid out. And so if I had to choose one or the other, not repairing a fender bender is probably not going to send a bankruptcy court as quickly <laughs> as having yeah. this huge liability exposure. So let's talk about the overall impact of these decisions, because as we started with earlier, sometimes the budget is fixed. 
right? And so sometimes the end result is not necessarily to derive additional revenue, even though that would be ideal, but to really, you know, get them in the mindset of thinking through if these things happened, you know, again, all we're doing is we're shifting it from one pocket to the other. We're not getting rid of it. Well, to a degree, but in the moment, even in the personal lines, you know, um, you know, arena. I remember getting that call that we all get when you're working personal lines auto. Hey, I just paid off my car and I want to take full coverage off of it. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. Yeah. Congratulations, man. That must be a great feeling. What was the, what did you, what was the purchase price on that car? Oh, I paid 12,000. Awesome. And how long was that loan? Oh, yeah. it took me five years to pay it off. Okay, perfect. So if that brand new paid car were stolen out of your driveway right now, you've got 17,000 in the bank to go get a new one today, right? That's what yeah. you're telling me. And like, wait, what are you talking about? What I'm saying is that's in essence what you've asked me to do. You've said that you are now in a position, you know, it, it's the whole conversation of what leverage means. Right. You know, so even with that purchase, chances are, well, maybe or maybe not, that you may have had the money saved up to buy that car outright. But you chose to finance it because you understand that through leverage, it frees up some of that cash to do things, some other things with. And so insurance, in essence, allows you to do that as well in exchange for a premium. Now, when you have a loss, you have someone else that's going to come in and take care of that. So just because it's not being imposed on you, it's not forced anymore, there's not compulsory, no lien holder or bank is going to tell you you have to carry this. That doesn't mean it's unnecessary, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. And yeah. then I always remind them, because that's, you know, my, my finishing move, The great news is you don't have a car note anymore. Congratulations. Take that budget (laughs) and do something else with it. But let's not mess with the premium. You know, when you retell it back to someone and it resonates a little different, all of a sudden they see themselves in that scenario on the side of that highway in the middle of the rain and the wrecker is towing that car out of there. And they're like, man, I shouldn't have called in two weeks ago to save 50 bucks a month. So yeah. there's bigger and smaller implications, but it's just making sure that people have the proper mindset of what it is that we do and what it is that the reason you're paying the premium is so that you don't have to pay, like you said, 100% deductible right. or copay. Like, what do you mean 100%? Well, if I'm not paying for it, that means you picked up the whole tab. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it's it's an infinite deductible, right? Like, especially like on liability, right? So on the physical damage one, it's it's uh, it's just you know there is a finite extent to that deductible. But on the liability side, it's like if you go uncovered on the liability side, I mean that's essentially you know a, a blank check. You know, um, I, I think in the business world as well, um, like like you said, there there's a certain investment value that's built up in that asset or that, you know, the car, the business, the the house, whatever it is, right? Um, so you're not just insuring the loan, right? You're, you're insuring the actual value of that thing. And as crappy of an investment as a car is, okay, unless you're some ultra successful, like, you know, collector's car person, speculator, um, there there's still an intrinsic value left over when the loan's done. Right. Um, short of when your car is, you know, 20 years old, then we can, you know, all right, fine. We'll, we'll, we'll pull off the physical damage coverage because the $200 that you'll get from the insurance company isn't really going to, you're not going to be out that much if, if you don't get that back. Right. Um, but so uh, it, it's awesome that you use the car analogy because the analogy that I have when I come to, uh, when I come to kind of like the the proposal point with uh, specifically, you know, commercial PNC clients, even even kind of with with personal lines clients, is I love to and and some of these are older adages, so I always have to kind of like pick and choose the vehicles that I'm using for the analogy, um, depending on how old the person is sitting across the street, across the table from me, or in this case, across the Zoom call. Um, but so there, there's three cars typically that I, I, I almost try and always come with three options to the table. Okay. Um, the, the worst of which is always going to be, and this is like a, uh, this is something again, where I have to choose the, the, the clientele wisely. Okay. Yeah. This is a, a Ford Pinto. 
All right. So okay. if anyone remembers what a Ford Pinto is, if you're old enough to know what a Ford Pinto is, all right, the Ford Pinto is not like looked at as a luxury car, nor was it really looked at as like an amazing car. It was just something to hopefully get you from A to B. Okay. okay. So that's baseline minimum. That's, you know, charge me as little as you can in order for me to say I have insurance. You're, you're getting sold the Pinto. Okay. Uh, you want to take one step up from there. I would say probably the present day equivalent to this is a Honda Accord. All right. It's got some frills. It's comfortable. It does more than just get you to A to B. It's reliable, that kind of thing, right? F fuel efficient. All right. And then the last one is always, again, a mix up. Usually the Honda Accord is pretty much you can, you can keep that or Toyota Camry. Either one is swappable with whatever your audience is. But the, the Pinto, you might have to talk about something like, you know, a Toyota Corolla or something if it's someone who's younger. All right. Uh, but young and old, like the, the high end also changes a little bit. So the other one that I'll use like on the high end with someone who's older is the Cadillac. They always remember like the Cadillac is the thing. OK, um, not so much nowadays. Nowadays, like if you have like a millennial or something like that sitting across the table from you, it's probably gonna be like you're gonna talk about a Tesla, okay? Yeah. Maybe a Mercedes. They know they know the you know prestige, I guess, that comes with the, the Mercedes. But so that's what we're looking at: the Pinto, the Honda Accord, and the Cadillac. I always try and come with at least three options if I can get them. Right? Sometimes you're stuck with just you know two of the three. Um, and then sometimes you have an ENS case where it's just basically the Cadillac. You're stuck. It's oh, yeah. Cadillac or nothing, you know, <laughs> which I actually kind of prefer those because it's really easy to make that sale typically. Um, but so that being said, uh, do you typically come with two or three or four options? I mean, at some point in time, the, the, the prospect gets a little, um, kind of like inundated with options, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. I, do you have a magic number? Yeah, so I think three is good, and that kind of goes back to, you know, we're saying the same thing, the good, better, and best. Um, oftentimes with startups, you know, when you're working in small commercial, people just need whatever the cert holder, the additional insured, whatever the checklist says. No more, no less. They're just really needing to get in the door. Uh, they're pre-revenue sometimes. And so if I have to sell that, then oftentimes that's accompanied by a disclosure that says, these are all the things that I recommended. These are the things that you opted into. We're putting that in a file and that we're going to sell this with the understanding that we're going to revisit this in three, six months, whatever that time frame is, yeah. knowing that, you know, again, parallel to the personal line side, you just want homeowners insurance to close on your mortgage. You're trying to get across the, the closing table. But once you get moved in and you've done your upgrades and you've done, you know, brought things in, we're going to have to look at this again because what you needed to get, you know, off the runway is not where you're going to need when you're at cruising altitude. I need you to come back to the table. Yeah. You know, so when you plant that seed early and let them know that is this compliant? Yes. Is this sufficient? Maybe. Is this the best case scenario? Now, one of the things that a, a mentor of mine shared with me, because in the small commercial space, um, sometimes you can overshop something, mm. you know. Sure. And so I tried to come in and have like these three options. But the truth was that with those budgets, like from top to bottom, Matt, the spread was like a hundred bucks. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, the advice that was given to me is you just need to learn how to pitch this different. Okay. And so the way that I pitched it different was based on all the things you just shared with me during this discovery conversation. This is the one that I highly recommend. And let me tell you why, mm. you know? And so if they say, I want something different. And again, you know, there's a difference between, between selling on value and on price. Right. And so value could mean, more coverage, less money, more coverage, same money, you know, and depending on the clientele, you know, you're talking to someone who has made a significant investment in their business. So they're not bottom basement bargain shoppers in general, right? They, they've bought a property in a nice part of town. They have a higher end fleet, you know, they have, uh, you know, again, they're trying to build an image of being top notch. And so if you're, top notch, then pricing really shouldn't be the only 
decision factor. And right. so sometimes to your point, giving options as a broker, as an independent, what I'm trying to relay to the customer is that I've shopped you around, mm -hmm. you know, that I'm not necessarily in cahoots from the back pocket of one particular carrier, right. that unlike an agent who represents a carrier, I'm a broker, I represent you. And so we're trying to relay that sense of I've looked around and this is the best deal possible. Right. But depending on how complex that proposal is, then you start getting into that whole paralysis of analysis. You've yeah. given them too much info, too many choices. It's like going to those restaurants and the menu is like a, a, a book. And you're like, I wanted a salad. I just didn't know that there were going to be 15 to choose from. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now I'm second thinking things. So sometimes simplifying it or maybe even just going in with two, A or B. You know, so it's not a matter of if, it's just which. And if you go at the lower one right now, it's with the expectation that we're going to revisit this. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's great. That's a, that's a, um, a fantastic idea where, first of all, you're playing the long game as well, right? So you're setting up that conversation for, all right, this is what things look like today. You know, what are things gonna look like in the future, right? And, and you know, will those possible or, or required solutions change, right? Um, I, I, I think I come at it from a little bit of a different angle in that, again, it's, it's situation dependent, right? So you kind of have to feel it out. That's more the art than the science, right? The, the art is, can I just come to them and say, look, this is my recommendation. And, you know, you've, you've done a good enough of a job of, um, establishing rapport and authority and going through the process and saying, now that we're at the end of the line, this is the answer, right? Um, I think some clients you're gonna you're gonna get um, that ability to do that with. Other clients, um, the reason why I bring three options to the table is because I know it's in their best interest to go with more than what they're expecting, right? Mm -hmm. So, but but at the end of the day, I want them to feel like they made the right that they made the right decision, right? Um, I'll recommend one. And I think that kind of cuts through that, uh, you know, paralysis by analysis, because you have someone in front of you that uh, is is advocating one of the, the options. Uh, what I'll typically do is I lead with the Cadillac. Mm -hmm. I say, okay, you know, if 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 you can swing it, this is the best of the best right here. You will not want if if you take this. And part of that process is selling it by, again, going line by or side by side, this exposure, this coverage, this exposure, this coverage. So we're basically covering everything with the best possible situation. Um, and this is what it costs. And now you have to sit there and look at what their reaction is. If they're completely stone faced or um, or even if they're like, ah, like what, you know, if that's the reaction, now we go to phase two, right? Agreed. The reason why you lead with the Cadillac is because maybe they're just like, okay, that sounds good. Let's go with that. Now, now you're not even talking exactly. about the other two, right? All right. right. So then, then it's a question of whether or not you give them the Pinto next or you give them the, or you give them your choice next. I typically give them the Pinto next. I show them what the extremes are. Okay. This is bargain basement. And then what I do is I don't like crap on the quote, but I tell them where it's insufficient, right? Yeah. I'll tell them, you know, what boxes it, it doesn't check and why that's risky, all right? And then the 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 close is you, you give them the Honda Accord and you say, now, if I was in your shoes, this is the one I would go with. Okay. And then you proceed to talk about, you know, how it addresses the issues, how it addresses their exposures, where it's a little light and why that might matter or not matter. Um, and, and really kind of spend your time on that one, right? Like you don't necessarily have to spend your time so much on the other two, spend mm -hmm. a lot of time really digging into the one that ultimately you want them to take. Right. Um, I, it, it seems a little, it seems kind of like trickery like, um, but ultimately at the end of the day, again, like we're talking about something that really we're, we're not trying to technically upsell them a car, right? Like if their goal is to go from A to B, then yes, upselling them is kind of predatory. This one is kind of like, you know, leading a horse to water and kind of helping them drink, you know? Exactly. Um, yeah. I, I, but I, I love what you're talking about. I, I think that process also helps too, because even if they still do go with the Pinto, Mm -hmm. They at least know what they're working toward in terms of the, the accord, the next go around. 
So maybe you don't even get them into the accord that first, uh, you know, that first shot or that first renewal. But maybe the next renewal, you end up getting them into the accord because they've had some time to think about it. They were exposed to it. You get to show it to them again the second year. Hopefully, the really cheap option gets more expensive relative to the the middle line one because people have tons of claims or something like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's really kind of the process I go through. Uh, when I'm kind of like putting that out there now, um, what would you say your success record is? I think, and again, you're coming at it from a different angle than I am, but, um, what's like a good hit ratio with you? And then how much of that hit, hit ratio would you say is, you know, going with that ideal kind of recommended solution? So that's kind of a complicated question to answer today, <laughs> yeah. being that I do very little direct sales right now, whereas I lead a sales team, you know, so I used to be able to tell you like what my batting average was <laughs> when I was in the seat a little bit more. Yeah. Um, but what I will tell you is that, you know, in this world, and, and you alluded to it, where insurance is being viewed more and more as a commodity. Um, then, you know, the, the sale, the clothes that we make, like at our agency, I always tell them it's a threefold close. They have to buy into you as the professional, right? They have to want to be doing business with you. Mm -hmm. uh, they have to buy into our agency as a whole. You know, they have to feel like they're being taken care of. And then lastly, the carrier, you know, the actual yeah. paper that we're putting it on. And so you have to be able to nail down those three parts of the triangle in order to get to the close. Because if any of that is lacking, they like you, but they're not sure about the carrier. They like you, but something about the agents. You know, if you're missing any of that, you've got to be able to tie all those pieces down. Yeah. Um, but to your point, you know, along the process, you're going, you're, you're doing these soft closes. You're checking in and making sure that they are in agreement that we're approaching this the right way, that they appreciate how thorough that we're being, so that when we get to that end pitch, that based on all of these things, all these agreements, all these things that kind of, you know, roll up to this moment, this is how we've, you know, landed here. Um, but, you know, I think one of my favorite um, proposal models are the ones that kind of show you along the way, you know, it's kind of like the breaker box, right? Where you have all these switches <laughs> and it says, okay, so we get to this particular coverage, especially this is really helpful at renewal because I think a lot of customers, they just want to renew per expiring. Mm -hmm. And so when you're able to go in and say, hey, by the way, this is what per expiring would look like, right? So we have that comparable quote. But to bump up this to the next tier, it costs two fifty here. It costs another thousand here, uh, because oftentimes I, I've rarely met a customer that has said, "I want to be there." I yeah. don't want coverage in this area. More often than not, it's, it's a financial decision. It's a budget, right? And so sometimes people are interested in more, like, tell me more, how does that work? And so if you can show them up front how much of an impact on the overall premium it has, then they can kind of choose to opt in, opt out, kind of, again, flip those breaker switches and say, you know what, um, it's actually not that bad because hopefully, to your point, maybe even if there was a reduction of overall premium at renewal and now you're finding ways to you know save some of that premium by increasing coverage you know one of the things i think especially when it comes to the liability lines is explaining kind of ratios right so if you have somebody that has you know for example if you're selling a dno policy and you're like okay so for this limit my recommendation is that you consider this amount of coverage for every board member you have mm -hmm. or if your liability for every x number of dollars of revenue you ought to consider this number of dollars of of um coverage right and so that way people know when they're perhaps outgrowing where they were hey that was fine when you had five employees you're up to 50. Yeah. we need to look at this limit you know and so when you tell them that there's thresholds that there's a method to the madness that this recommendation isn't simply to get deeper into their pockets because they're earning more revenue, but you're explaining to them at this point, like, what is the average size of a job? What is the average amount? And so you can kind of help them see where you're going and quantifying. Okay, so if you're working on, you know, million plus dollar homes, you understand how one hiccup, you know, could potentially equal this you know, amount of a claim 
So, and you're working at how many on how many sites per day, you know, so when you're able to show them up front that the reason that this is sufficient is because this is where you are now. Right. But as you grow, as you scale, as you mature, there are going to be triggers that are going to bring us back to this table and say, now is the time for us to pull in, you know, that quote that we kind of, you know, had to table for a little while because you, you've arrived, you right. know. On the personal line side, especially in high net worth, I would explain to people, you know, everything is a misunderstanding until they recognize who you are, where you live, and what you're worth. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, that little fender bender that they were willing to wave away, they're going to call in for a police report today, right? Oh, yeah. My neck, my back, my hip. Oh, my God. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) It might have been okay until they're like, hold the phone. Your personalized license plate says that you're part of the football team, you know. (laughs) And so we want to just make sure that as you become more successful, as you have more at risk, as you have more to lose, you need to proportionately make sure that your coverage matches, you know, what your, you know, what you've got at risk. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. So what's funny is uh, perfect timing. Uh, we were kind of chatting back and forth. Mike K said, "Yeah, the Pintos had gas tank issues." So they would uh, they would get into an accident and catch on fire, right? Um, really bad claims. Uh, he said the Pintos are the reason why Lee Iacocca got fired from Ford. Um, and that's actually how he sold life insurance. <laughs> I, I don't know if he specifically meant Pintos, but um, that's an interesting thought. Relating back to what you were talking about, you know, say faced with the Pinto, you could always say like, well, you know, how much is it going to cost you additional a month for life insurance? And then how does that relate to another car that you might be able to buy that's on the lot? <laughs> Wow. Um, <laughs> um, I a little morbid, I know, but <laughs> my, my sense of humor is dark sometimes. But so anyway, um, that's also that that's a good point that you went over in terms of kind of setting expectations too, is when when you are kind of having those initial conversations, sometimes that insured or that prospect doesn't even know how much is a good price. They have no idea what it should cost, right? Um, and and you know, if you work in the industry, you should have some idea of it. If if it's a certain type of risk, you should know, um, you know, a, a per door cost. You should know, um, you know, a, a percentage of revenue, and be conservative about it. Okay, so like for certain clients, I know like whether it's like two or three percent of revenue that they should probably budget for their property and casualty premium. Mm-hmm. Right. So and if I walk in the door day one and I set that expectation and I come in at or under that number, I've now, you know, I've, I've now kind of uh, reinforced the credibility of, yeah. of that number. Right. I, I think the other thing is if you do find that you're going to be outside that number, you need to telegraph that as early as possible. Right. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of brokers are afraid that if they telegraph that they're not going to hit the number, that all of a sudden the prospect or the insured is going to go run and find another broker. And that's entirely possible. Okay. Mm -hmm. But if you're truly, you know, this is more specific to independent brokers, but if you're truly knocking on all the carrier doors that are probably going to be amenable to writing that risk, you still don't really have a lot to worry about. What you have to worry about is losing your credibility so that the next election cycle, they go find a broker early on, right? Yeah. That, that's something that you got to watch out for. I, I think that's a huge piece of this too, is like throughout the marketing process, like you don't have to tell them every nuanced detail of what you're going through, but keep the client updated. Let them know. Like if you're running into issues, I've had biotech firms recently where because of COVID and different dynamics in the economy, there's some like the 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 normal marketplace would have had a half dozen carriers willing to write something. Now we're lucky to get one that puts like all kinds of restrictive language onto a manuscript mm-hmm. form. Like that, that's and that's a big difference. And so when that switch happens, definitely you know you keep the client involved in that conversation. Um, have Have you uh, ever run into the situation where like a client comes back with with buyer's remorse? Um, on occasion, and, and normally it's when they've bitten off more than, than they can chew. Mm. And so this is where I'm going to kind of go back to yet another life and health comparison. Um, so when I was selling life and health insurance, especially life insurance with all the different products that are available, you know, you would get the question, like, what is the best type of policy? Right. And my answer was the best type of life insurance is the one that pays at the end. 
It does you no good to jump in the deep end of the pool to buy this Cadillac and then not be able to make the payments on it and they have to come repo it, right? Yeah. <laughs> now you've just thrown this money out there and there's no ROI whatsoever. So I would rather you have a more modest policy that you can hold on to, right? Because that's the one that's actually going to, you know, pay off in the end. And so sometimes, you know, again, you'll you'll get the the panic call, you know, I want to drop coverage. You know, when I was selling a lot of tech E&O, mm -hmm. um, we would have, you know, with developers and, you know, the, the computer guys, uh, they would buy insurance to the hilt because they're trying to bid on work and they're trying to get in the door. And then after a couple months of flailing, you know, they haven't landed a contract. And so, or they do a short term stint and they want to call you eight weeks later and say, cancel it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like, no, it's not really how this works. So do you plan to work again this year? <laughs> like, well, yeah, I plan to work again. That was just one project. That project's over. I was like, because what's going to happen is you're going to build up this body count of canceled policies midterm. Mm -hmm. And when you come back, you're going to have less and less options of who wants to rewrite you. This was written as an annual policy. And so my advice is, you know, when you're, you know, kind of in the you know, land of milk and honey and the money's pouring in, go ahead and pay these things up for the year, paid in full if possible. That way in the lean time, in between time, you're less tempted to try to cancel it. You know, and for certain customers, you have to explain to them the difference between pro rata and a short rate. Yeah. If you just canceled it all willy nilly, you're leaving money on the table. You're not going to be able to recoup. There's yep. minimum premiums involved. There's fully earned fees involved. It's just not going to benefit you to try to bail. So whenever possible, we need you to stick it out. Uh, 2020 has been a perfect example of that. Several industries that were hit and times got really lean and just trying to encourage them, if you can just hold on to this, maybe we can do an endorsement or something in the interim to try to find you some relief. But I would not let this go because you're just now on the cusp of really hitting, you know, three consecutive years of coverage, five consecutive years of coverage, which is a rate basis. And right. so to your point, you know, explaining to customers changes in the marketplace um, in my industry now is really about showing them what their underwriting profile looks like to an underwriter. Mm. Sometimes they have things that are out there that they weren't even aware of. You know, so I work in transportation and trucking. Mm -hmm. We'll go through what the DOT has on file for them. Are you still moving these kinds of commodities? Because right now, publicly, you still have all of these boxes checked. And if that's not really what you're doing, then you need to go back and make those corrections so that we can show the underwriter you've updated your profile. Customers aren't aware of how they're being judged. And so if a number is out of sync, I know a couple of years ago, I had an architecture and engineering firm that I had insured. And so we sent out the renewal questionnaire. They sent it back in. It's like a 20% rate increase. Yep. Of course, the principal, the firm's on the phone, losing it. <laughs> You know, next to payroll, this is my next biggest expense, and this is unacceptable, and this is the second year in a row. And I said, let's do this. Me, you, and the underwriter. I'm going to see if they're agreeable to hop on a call. Mm -hmm. And so an underwriter got on a call and said, this is why the needle moved. Your percentage of this type of work increased from here to here. Ideally, we like to see it in this range. When asked a question, do you always get a written contract? You said sometimes. A definite yes is more helpful, right? So they broke down and showed the customer that based on some business practices that they could apply in-house instantly, and it was going to make a difference on their insurance premium. They didn't even know that it was a problem not to, you know, do a written contract every single time. Yeah. But when you are able to explain to the customer that, you know, you have different parts of this application that are weighted differently, and these answers are indicative of maybe not having such great controls here or maybe not having enough oversight here. And so when you can involve them, I'm not saying that we're going to encourage them to falsify an app. <laughs> what I'm saying is that we are going to help give them some feedback that maybe, that again, they'll apply to their business practices now. Right. And say, wow, so by doing business this way. So funny thing with that particular client, that particular renewal was done. Right. They paid that 20 percent increase the following year. The email that I get starts off with kind of dear precious. So last year you helped us with, you know, kind of changing our business model. So wait, hold on. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> credit. That's not what I did. I just gave you insight onto the implications on your insurance. 
yeah. you know. Um, but what was interesting is, of course, with all the huffing and puffing with the 20 percent uptick, which was substantial. I'm not going to discredit. He had, you know, a, a legitimate, you know, complaint, um, mm. but he paid it gladly. Because what he got out of that is that actually provoked a deeper conversation that wouldn't have happened if it just renewed for expiring. Right. So right. we always have to find those opportunities to reinvite them back to the table and put it in their mind that this is a living, breathing thing. It's not a set it and forget it. We're going to want to keep our eye on this for, you know, increases, decreases or whatever is necessary. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it can also uh, that, that those are. Uh, fantastic um, stories. I, the, the the other thing that can help is putting things in terms of the client's business practice and, and helping them kind of understand it from that standpoint. So like you mentioned 2020 and kind of people just kind of, you know, scuttling the ship wherever it was and, and kind of abandoning it and figuring, all right, well, I'll come back for it maybe in the future. Um, I mean, contractors was a big one. If you're a contractor and you have this, uh, you know, just trail of dead bodies behind you in terms of the insurance companies that you've spurned or, or you canceled early or, or canceled for non-pay, just say, look, what would you do if you were subbing for a bigger general contractor and you took three jobs from them and every single time they didn't pay you, right? <laughs> or if you knew from other subcontractors that this next general contractor, you heard from three subcontractors that they pay slow, they'll fight you on every single bill, and everything like that. Are you going to be inclined to do business with that person? Chances are no. The same thing applies to that insurance company, right? Absolutely. So sometimes it helps to kind of uh, connect those parallel dots in terms of, you know, what the actual insured or prospect is, you know, their business model. and. Mm -hmm helping them kind of understand it from from that angle so yeah i don't i don't get a whole lot of buyer's remorse i can definitely say that i haven't written a lot of tech you know but i have had that experience with the tech you know as well you know the consultant gets one job and then all of a sudden thinks that they're going to get 15 other jobs right behind it so that you know they're they're going to be warren buffett tomorrow and it's and it's one it guy right like that's doing most of the work um and yeah, you know, the, the, and then the, the other conversation is, you know, if you're a, a professional uh, consultant or advisor or, or, you know, an engineer or an architect or something like that, um, I've had conversations where, you know, the one contract ends, they don't necessarily have something lined up. Let's keep the E&O going, right? Like you can, you could drop the GL if it's an on, on a current basis, right? right? If it's a combined product, obviously you got to keep the whole thing. But if you have a separate E&O and, and, and GL, keep the E&O going. Right. And, and let's just keep that alive because that's on a claims made basis. So the last thing yeah. you want is something to, you know, that bites you two years later. Um, and just because and you, you didn't have any contracts. Yeah. That retro date, you know, yes, you don't want to let go of that retro date. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like yeah. It's necessary. You want to claw and fight and stay in place because you will lose it if you try to cancel it and pick it back up again. Yeah, which by which by the way is also one of those upsell opportunities, right? Like to get a little bit of little nerdy, uh, you know, anything that's claims made, if you can get full prior acts on it, like if it's an EPL or a you know policy, and you can get full prior acts on it, that it almost like as long as it's a manageable amount of money, that is worth its weight in gold, gold like that that you don't even. Uh, you know, like, and you don't even comprehend it until something happens 15 years later and you're like, wait a minute, they had full prior racks. We're okay. Like, that's fine. You know? And also so. offering tail coverage. Cause I think a lot of yeah. people forget about that. You know, yeah. they're like, I'm going out of business. We want to close it. And with most of those policies, you only have one shot to do it, yeah. you know, and, and normally you got to pay it lump sum, you know, for X number of years, uh, but you have to remind them, especially like I said, the professional lines, you may stop seeing new clients as of this date, but you know, especially, you know, in the like account accountants, anyone who works with the IRS, they have this number of years to still come back, mm -hmm. you know? And so just because you're not taking new clients, you want to go ahead and, and, you know, lock that in while that's available, you know, and even reminding people about that, you know, I've, I've always said it, that you learn so much more from a goodbye than a hello. Mm. You know, when you're, you know, wrap, wrapping up operations, when customers are retiring, um, asking that question, when property is being sold, are you on good terms with the buyer? You know, yeah. do we have an opportunity there? If someone's retiring, are you handing the practice on to somebody else? Yeah. 
you know. So looking for and asking those questions, I think, is really the key. It's that additional, um, it may not have been one of the required things on your checklist to go over, but when you say, hey, you know what, as I thought about that more, how are you handling this? If this comes up, did you know that there's an opportunity to make sure, you know, that you still have, you know, coverage in place? Um, yeah. And I'll also say, you know, when it comes to, you know, the referrals, because sometimes the upsells are just when you make such an impression with a customer where they're like, hey, you know, I appreciate the fact that you were thorough, you were insightful, you were knowledgeable. And, um, you know, I used to um, write I guess you'll call them chains. And so, you know, where you have these different franchisees, whatever the case is, and you know that these people have influence in their various circles. Right. And so I would say, hey, look, I'm so glad we can get you taken care of. If there's anyone who has a you know similar need, you know, someone that you come across, you know, because once you've figured them out, you know, that's also, you know, another end. So sometimes the upsell comes from just really positioning yourself with confidence to ask for those referrals or introductions. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that is, uh, that's an episode that we could completely do is, is the, the concept of, uh, like finding your niche so that those kind of, um, referral based and just completely organic type of new opportunities, um, begin to kind of create themselves, you know? Um, and, and I think the take home is even if you're upselling, like don't upsell, uh, in this kind of like hard sell, you know, mode. Okay. Make sure that the client is ultimately the one that says, you know, yes or no, and that they're comfortable and they understand what they're getting versus what they're paying. If you do your job from that respect, you know, those referrals will come because as opposed to someone referring you to someone else saying, oh my God, they saved me, you know, X, Y, and Z. They're going to be saying, this person's brilliant. You should, you should listen to them. Right. Which is a much better expectation than they signed, than they saved me this, that, you know, this oh, yeah. arbitrary amount of money or this arbitrary percentage. Um, so that, that's a huge take home. We should definitely find someone, um, find someone who's working in a very interesting niche just to kind of like talk that episode through and, you know, kind of how you do identify your niche is, is, is always a good one. Um, there's a lot of emerging business out there, cannabis being one of them. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I know some people, you know, in my network that have really leveraged that and it's just, you know, taking off astronomically. Um, and, and there's changes to exposures too. So my, you know, takeaways, especially as we continue to focus on 2020 mm -hmm. is, you know, um, your LROs, your lessers, you know, risk, um, making sure that they understand what their policy says in terms of vacancies. Yep. So that's something that we're coming across where for commercial buildings, if you've got companies that have gone remote work, what classifies being vacant? Is the presence of utilities enough or does there have to be bodies in there? And if not, do you know where you stand on glass coverage and stuff like that? You know, so even just checking in, because I think that the the easy notion is that when the economy is in a downturn, it's not the good best time to upsell. Right. Um, but when the economy's downturn creates an additional exposure that maybe wasn't there at the point of sale, you know, now's a really good time just from a human to human standpoint to check in with your customers and say, hey, how are you guys faring? Has this impacted you at all? You know, what are you guys doing differently? And then that can lead to those discovery conversations. So not waiting until renewal having you know your finger on the pulse and, and being able to very organically introduce it from the standpoint of not hey i'm here to shake the tree because i need to make a sale yeah. <laughs> but yeah. I, I really want to make sure that you're still going to be okay when we get on the other side of this yeah and and i think we've mentioned this before on on earlier episodes but uh, also the idea of like if if your client is you know scuttling a certain portion of their operation or scaling back somewhere to the point where they're saving money, you don't necessarily have to sell them something else to fill that commission gap. Like that would be the wrong answer. But the right answer is, you know, with COVID, you have increased, uh, you have increased exposure in the employment practices liability arena, right? You have increased exposure in the workers' comp arena. So there are certain elements of their program that, you know, if they're scaling back or, or scuttling it and they're seeing savings in some areas, 
you know, make sure that you're also being a good professional and advising that maybe they beef up coverages in some other areas so that, you know, maybe maybe they don't use all of the savings, but, you know, they're, they're at least kind of further protecting themselves in areas that have now become higher risk than they were in the past. So that's that's definitely uh, pretty important. That's all I really got. Uh, do you have anything else as far as like up upselling or, or anything like that goes, Precious? No, um, I think that, you know, again, that's kind of in the vein of the, the topic and the conversation is do so from the position of being helpful. Um, as long as you go into every you know, interaction, and I think most of us that are in the industry hopefully are here for the, the right reasons, mm -hmm. which is to take care of, you know, helping customers navigate all of these decisions, yep. making sure that they're fully aware of the implications of either proceeding or not, yep. you know, because sometimes it's not a no, it's just a not now. Yeah. But if you plant planted a seed and if it's something that keeps them up at night, and to your point, the customer at the end of the day needs to feel persuaded and not pressured um, because we would hate for someone to bind with me, hang up and call my colleague <laughs> and say, she just didn't know how to take no for an answer, but I really don't want to do that. Yeah. You know, because the, the long game is that satisfied customers, the persistency is higher, they stay longer, and so the lifetime value of the customer increases versus, you know, some people are afraid to poke the bear because like, well, if they're already happy and I disturb them. And, and I remember I did at a previous agency, we went on like this um, campaign of reaching out and offering stuff. And instead we got like a whole slew of like LPRs, like, oh, I still had that active. Oh no. Yeah. That. And they're like, <laughs> I was like calling the offer cancellations. You know? And my very last takeaway is um, don't overlook the obvious. There's certain lines of business that you know that they have and maybe elsewhere. You know, for example, you may have a doctor's med mal, but you don't have the GL. Hmm. Yeah. Where is that? You've got the ERISA bond. You don't have the work comp. You know, so when you kind of look for what's missing, because the chances are they have it, it's just elsewhere. And right. so that's when you is more of a relationship. Hey, I would love to take care of all of your needs. I'm fully able to do so. We have the markets. We're able to, you know, again, that might be a situation for, you know, BORs and things like that, helping people consolidate. Because yep. sometimes they'll tell you, oh, you do that? I always thought that you were just the e &O guy or whatever yep. the case is. And so if you do have a, you know, variety of offerings, opening our mouths and letting people know, hey, I can also do these other things for you. Because sometimes sales would just, you know, fall in your lap because like, oh, we didn't realize that you guys were in that market. Yep. Yeah. No, I, that's that's a good, that's a fantastic point. I To, to take a quick step back, uh, CPCUs, remember your ethics pledge, okay? Even though you're a salesperson, remember your ethics pledge. Um, and, and two, you're completely spot on a number of prospects. I tell them that I get paid to be an insurance janitor. I will come clean up the mess, the rat's nest that you have, the, the policies on top of the policies on top of the policies that have never been looked at by, you know, for any rhyme or reason or synchronicity. Um, I have no problem going blind on your, uh, you know, your three ring binder <laughs> with all of the policies that, you know, the keepers, if you will, that you have in there. Um, but yeah, so th that's all really good, really, really good information. So uh, look, we could we could do uh, probably a week's worth of material on this. We'll have to do one on also rounding, account rounding um, yes. tools and tactics and techniques. So look for that in the future. Um, if you've made it that this far with us, thank you very much. Again, please remember, like, comment, subscribe, share, uh, retweet, hit the notification bell, get this out there for anyone that could use it. And uh, again, we'll be back next Wednesday, 3 p.m. as usual. Precious, thank you. My pleasure.